Growing up in the South, I have heard plenty of folklore stories, creature stories from Bigfoot to sea serpents, everything in between. And I can definitely tell you that stories from the South always give me a bit more of a chill than usual, because I can definitely relate and attest to a lot of them. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true horror stories sent in by viewers just like you from the good old South. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or on reddit at r slash the dark swamp. I'd love to see your story and share it with everyone here in the swamp. Sometimes while fishing, I like to throw hands with Bigfoot while I'm waiting for the big one to bite. Sometimes I even see Nessie from the Loch Ness come up and they start talking smack. So the only thing I know how to do to handle my anxiety before I start slapping up all the cryptids around me is to take my microdose gummies. Now I'm sure you know the, the anxiety that you'll get facing a 900 pound, 7 foot tall humanoid hairy beast will give you and microdose gummies do exactly what I want them to do. I'm not really into a lot of other things that'll get you out of your mind to make you relax. For me, just a half of a gummy is the perfect dose to help me relax at the end of the day and get those mental monsters off my back or those literal ones that just won't let go. Yeah, you think I didn't see you, Mothman? With microdose gummies, it keeps my brain straight focused and clear, so when those giant pesky monsters come slapping at my door, I can handle it with ease. So, what are you waiting for? Microdose is available nationwide. Join me and many others in the swamp today. To learn more about microdosing THC, go to microdose.com and use code SWAMPED to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Links can be found in the show description, but again, that's microdose.com and code SWAMPED. Tennessee Creepiness by Number Economy 8518 I was in my last year before retiring from the army, and was going through a pretty bad divorce. My soon-to-be ex returned to Texas with my two girls, and I planned to move closer to them once my retirement was official. I rented a small, two-bedroom apartment in Tennessee in a small town called Indian Mound. Indian Mound was wet. One night, I came home around one in the morning from a concert in Nashville. It was early spring, and it was somewhat foggy out. The driveway dipped down and the house was about an eighth mile from the road. As I pulled in, I saw a huge black dog standing in the front yard, and it looked like a black lab or a lab mixed breed. It stood with its head up and its tail straight up. It was fixated on me. I slowly pulled my car up, unsure of what to do next. When it turned and ran into the swamp, I didn't think much of it and went inside. Over the following few months, Things started happening at night. I would always wake up around 3 or so in the morning, thinking I heard voices outside my window. And sometimes it sounded like someone or a couple of people were whispering to each other, but I couldn't quite understand what they were saying. Sometimes, I would hear footsteps and movement outside. I thought it was maybe a deer or some sort of dog, or perhaps even the dog I saw earlier. But when I looked out, I saw absolutely nothing. This type of stuff continued for months. One night, I woke up to a noise and saw it was 2.57. A bright white light shone through the porch glass doors. I ran out into the kitchen and looked through the small sink window and it looked like someone was out in the swamp shining a spotlight. It was one of those high-powered lights used in search and rescue. It was blinding and lit up the entire kitchen. I opened the back doors and ran onto the porch. I was yelling that I was calling the cops and to get out of here. The light suddenly went out and I heard someone moving away from the house through the swamp. The cops eventually came out, took a report, and told me to keep my doors locked and to call if anyone else came around or if anything else happened. I was hypervigilant from that day on and sometimes I still am. I checked behind me when I was coming and going and always slept with the shades drawn and doors locked. The footsteps around the house continued and some nights I thought I could hear a dog panting outside my window. Although I never found tracks or any signs of an animal in the morning. Things eventually did die down after a while and I was about three months away from the end of my lease. I woke up around three in the morning, scared out of my mind. Not really knowing why, honestly. I was sleeping fairly well and heard a woman calling my name in my dream out of nowhere. 
I opened my eyes and realized it was just a nightmare when I heard the voice call my name again, clear as day. I shot up out of my bed and turned on the lights. I checked in the closet and under the bed in every which way, every nook and cranny of the house. I opened the bedroom door and listened out in the hallway. I couldn't hear anything and was about to cut the light and return to bed when someone started pounding on my front door. I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was like someone was bashing the door with a sledgehammer. I yelled out that I had a gun and to get the hell off my property. I said I would call the cops and I'll blow your freaking head off before they get here. The pounding stopped. Cops came out again and took another report, but there was no visible damage to the door or footprints around the property. It all just stopped after that. I did actually buy a 9mm, but the rest of my time renting there was actually very peaceful. I'm back in Texas now, in an apartment complex in the suburbs, but I really don't mind. The backwoods of Tennessee were a creepy place. Never Solo Hike in the South by Anonymous I've always loved hiking, especially solo hikes where I can lose myself in nature and forget about the rest of the world for some time. So when I had a chance to take a week off of work and explore the rural South, I jumped at the opportunity. I packed my backpack with all the essentials, water, food, a map, a compass, a first aid kit, and a flashlight. I also brought my tent and a sleeping bag in case I wanted to camp out for a night or two. The first few days were actually quite amazing. I walked through lush forest and along winding streams, spotting wildlife and enjoying the peacefulness of the woods. But on the fourth day, everything changed. I was walking along a narrow trail and I heard a very uh, odd noise to say the least. It sounded like a mix between a growl and a grunt, coming from somewhere just up ahead on the trail. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. I've heard stories of bears, wild boars, and all that stuff in the area, but I've never encountered one before. I took a deep breath and tried to stay calm. I slowly reached for my bear spray, but the noise stopped before I could even take it out of my pocket. I waited for a couple of minutes, but nothing seemingly happened. I shrugged it off as my imagination and kept on walking. As I continued down the trail, I noticed that the woods around me seemed... different. The trees were twisted and gnarled and the leaves on the ground were blackened and dead. The air was thick with an overpowering smell like rotten eggs mixed with something that I couldn't quite place. I tried to shake off this feeling of unease and kept walking, but when I heard the noise again, closer this time, I spun around, but there was absolutely nothing there, just the empty trail behind me and the twisted trees ahead. I started to walk a bit faster, my heart starting to pick up in pace. The noise kept getting louder closer and more frequent. I felt like something or someone was watching me, following me. But every time I turned around, there was nothing there. Finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. I broke into a run, my backpack bouncing on my back. The noise was now a constant, deafening roar that filled my ears and made my head spin. I felt like I was going insane. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, everything had stopped. I collapsed into the ground, gasping for breath. The woods around me were silent and the air smelled fresh again. I don't know how long I laid there, but when I finally stood up, I knew I had to get the heck out of here. I hiked back as fast as possible to my car, never looking back one time. I didn't stop until I was safely back into civilization. To this day, I don't know what happened to me in those woods, but I will never forget that feeling of terror and helplessness, alone in the dark woods of the rural south. Urban Exploration Nightmares by Steph G3 I'm still trying to figure out why I agreed to go on this urban exploration trip with my friends in the first place. It could have been the excitement of exploring somewhere new or some crazy abandoned place or breaking the rules I guess, but whatever it was, I regret it now as we made our way to an abandoned asylum in the middle of rural Alabama. The hospital was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by dense trees and overgrown vegetation. It had been left for years to rot, and nature started reclaiming the building. 
My friends and I had to push through the vines and thorns even to get to the entrance. The temperature dropped as soon as we entered inside and an eerie silence settled over us. The hospital was dark and the only light came from the flashlights that we were holding. The floorboards creaked under our feet and echoed through the empty halls. We explored the first few floors and everything seemed normal, but as we made our way to the upper levels, things started to get very creepy. The air felt heavy, and I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched by something. The hospital was full of old medical equipment, furniture, and strange symbols and graffiti. We found ourselves in a room with an old operating table in the center. The table was covered in rust, and the tools on the tray next to it looked like they had actually been used recently though. The walls were covered in recent, strange symbols in writing that had definitely only been there a few weeks at most. The room was unusually cold. Suddenly, we began to hear footsteps coming from the hallway. We froze, unsure of what to do. The footsteps grew louder and we heard a low chanting behind the door. My friends wanted to investigate, but I wanted to avoid sticking around to find out what was going on on the other side of that door. I grabbed one of their flashlights and started to make my way back down the stairs. But as soon as I walked through the dark and creepy hospital, I realized I was not alone. I could hear something breathing behind me. And every time I would turn around, of course, there was nobody ever there. I started to run. I was freaking the heck out, my thoughts running wild. But no matter how fast I ran, the breathing that was stalking me never stopped. It was always constant, right there in my ear. I could feel something getting closer and closer, and I knew I was in some sort of real danger. I burst through the front doors of the hospital, my friends close behind me as we ran into our car. I could hear the chanting growing louder and louder. I don't know what we stumbled on in the hospital, but I never want to return there again, and anybody who's in rural Alabama and they stumble upon an abandoned mental asylum, definitely don't explore it. The St. John's River Monster Chased Me by Donnie B. I was absolutely ecstatic to kayak down the St. John's River in Florida. I had heard that it was one of the state's most beautiful and peaceful kayaking destinations. As I pushed off from the shore and paddled out into the river, I couldn't help but feel a sense of peace and tranquility. The sun was shining, the water was calm, I paddled along enjoying the beautiful scenery and the occasional splash of water from my paddle. But as I went further down the river, things started to feel off. The water began to get choppier, and I could feel something pulling at my kayak from below. At first, I thought it was just the current, but then I felt something brush up against my leg, and it sent shivers down my spine. I looked down in the murky water, trying to see what was beneath me, but I couldn't see anything. The feeling of being watched grew more robust, and I felt like something was circling my kayak. Suddenly, something slammed into the bottom of the kayak, sending me flying into the water. I thrashed around trying to get back into my kayak, but something grabbed me by the leg and pulled me underwater. I, I tried to struggle to get free, but the thing was holding onto me very strongly. It almost felt like tentacles, cold and slimy, wrapping around my body. I grasped for air, but all I could taste was salt water. I finally managed to break free and swim to the surface. Gasping for air as I did so, I clambered back into my kayak, shaking and terrified. I didn't know what had just attacked me, but I knew I needed to get out of the water immediately. As I returned to the shore, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still following me. Every time I looked back, I could see ripples in the water like something was just below the surface. When I finally reached the shore, I stumbled out of my kayak and collapsed onto the sand. I was shaking and covered in water. I couldn't believe what had just happened. As I caught my breath, I looked out into the river trying to see if I could spot the creature that had attacked me, but there was seemingly nothing there. The river was calm and peaceful like nothing had ever happened. It felt like I was going crazy, like maybe I had just imagined the entire thing. But as I returned to my car, I noticed something strange. The trees around me were all dead. Their leaves were brown and withered. It was like they had been sucked dry of life, and there was a strange smell in the air, like rotting fish and seaweed. I tried to shake off the dread creeping up, but I couldn't. 
I knew that something was just wrong, that something was lurking in the water. That night I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes I could feel something cold and slimy wrapping around my legs, pulling me under the water. I kept thinking about the dead trees and that strange smell, wondering if they were connected to the creature that had attacked me. The next day, I decided to try to get some research in. I searched the internet up and down for information about strange creatures in the St. John's River, and that's when I found it. There were rumors of an animal that lived in the depth of the river, a beast that had been there for centuries. Some called it the River Devil, while others called it the Water Hag. It was said to be a shapeless being, slimy, with tentacles that it used to drag its prey under the water. I couldn't believe what I was reading. It sounded like something straight out of a horror movie. But the more I read, the more convinced I became that the creature was real. And then I found something out even more disturbing. There have been reports of missing kayakers in the area, and I think I know why. I grew up in a very safe area for most of my young life. It was one of those neighborhoods where all the kids knew each other and often stayed out well after dark in the summers to play flashlight tag or search. Our biggest concern was calling our parents to let them know we would be sleeping over at our friend's house. I mention all of this to understand how terrifying my mother's story was to a relatively sheltered 16-year-old me. My mother was and remained one of the most muscular women I have ever known. She survived decades of mental, emotional, and I suspect in her early years physical abuse from my sociopathic father. When he tried to prevent her from getting away by refusing to help cover college expenses, she moved out and paid every cent independently. When a drunk redneck attempted to assault a friend of hers in a way that's not so good for YouTube, she gave him a hard right hook and dropped that pile of human garbage. And if people ever threatened her kid's safety, God help them. That woman would make Mama Grizzlies look friendly. So, as you might imagine, I never thought anything could scare this woman. But now I understand that even the bravest person can fear for their survival when monsters come out of the shadows. This takes place around 1985 in my home state of South Carolina. My parents had only been married for about two years, both very excited and determined to make something of themselves. They didn't have much money back then and rented a tiny apartment until they could save enough to buy a house. My mom hated that apartment, precisely the large window in their bedroom that people from the street could easily see into. They wanted to put up curtains, but there were no rods and the landlord was a cheapskate who threatened to keep their deposit if they even put a dent in the wall. It annoyed them that they couldn't even have privacy in their own home, but they decided to ignore it since it was a short-term lease. This would be a very big mistake. Never ignore your gut. This open window would cause mom to have nightmares for years after. And now, let me tell you about how a murderer first targeted my mom as a potential victim. My mom was an avid runner and a competitive cross-country athlete through high school and college. So, she often went for three or four mile long runs in the evenings to clear her mind after work. She was running in a rural area with few houses and a little traffic on the road. It was an area that high schools like to use in the fall for track and cross country training. She was out in early summer, so there were no students or other runners around. She liked the quiet and kind of mentally drifted off for a bit. As an old brown colored car with tinted windows came up behind her, she moved off the road to let them pass. The car seemed to be going past her. The windows were even with her and then it slowed down. The vehicle stayed this way for about 10 minutes or so, never speeding or slowing, only staying a few feet behind her. My mom realized this person had bad intentions and knew her life was potentially in danger. Worse, there was no one around who could help. She had to make a quick decision, so she sprinted off into the field next to her, thankfully finding a small ditch lined with several thick bushes. She crawled into the largest one and laid flat on her stomach to hide. The car had tried to follow, but the curb had hindered the back wheels. The person attempting to gun it, but the car would not go forward. They were able to reverse it and get back on the road. They drove up the road several times, most likely trying to see if they could spot my mom. After five or six passes, they gave up and drove off. Mom was so scared she barely remembered to breathe, shaking and crying, waiting for this malicious person to get out of the car. 
Thankfully, they never did. After waiting 30 minutes and no sign of the car, she returned to her apartment as quickly as she could. My dad was home at the time and shocked to see her state. She told him what had happened and wondered if they should call the cops. My dad promised her he would take care of it and told her to take a long warm shower so she could relax. After all, this was home and he would never let anyone hurt her. Mom took that shower and started feeling better when she looked out their bedroom window. I think you can guess what she saw parked just outside. It was the same car. Utterly terrified, she screamed and my dad came running. She pointed out the car and he lost it. He bolted out of the apartment and ran towards the car, shouting that he would kill them if they even thought about touching his wife. Just to let you know, my dad was about 5'10 and thin as a rail, friendly and always ready to give a helping hand. He was not an intimidating figure to most people, but that day, my dad showed that animal side of him. He showed this creep that he would do whatever it took to protect his family. The car immediately backed up, tires squealing as the man booked it. My parents later called the cops and told them everything. Unfortunately, there wasn't much they could really do but ask questions, basically, since there was no actual physical attack. All they could do was make a note and advise my mom not to run for quite some time. The way they said it made it seem as if she was the problem. They grudgingly accepted this and moved to a new place shortly after. No deposit was worth their lives. A few months passed and reports of multiple young women going missing followed by two murders brought closure to this story. My mom recognized the car the murderer was driving. It was the same one that had stalked her. What made her blood run cold was the picture of his victims. All young, blonde, blue-eyed women who could have been her sisters. Over the years, I've googled the victims and it's shocking how they looked just like her. Down to how they styled their hair. According to the FBI profiler who went on to write the book that inspired Mindhunter, this man was one of the most vicious and sadistic killers he had ever dealt with, maybe the most evil one in his career. After reading about how he would torture the families and make those poor girls write a last will before murdering them, I'm inclined to agree. For anyone wondering, you can learn more about this sick guy and his crimes by googling Larry Jean Bell. I want to say the year was 2005 or 2006. I was 7 or 8 years old and at a family cookout in a haunted ghost town called Pickneyville, South Carolina. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why the hell am I at a cookout in a ghost town? Well, a family friend owns the land that surrounds it, and still does to this day. I'm not sure what the event was for, but we were always barbecuing and riding ATVs through rural upstate South Carolina trails back then. It was just what we did. Now, I had always heard stories about this place from my mother and father, but I always brushed them off as BS or campfire tales. There are also rumors of the area being inhabited by devil worshippers, but I'm not so sure that's true. I didn't believe this place was haunted until my cousin and I rode our ATVs down one of the many trails. Just me and him, no one else. We were both young. I'm 7 or 8 and he's 8 or 9. It is broad daylight, and as we're riding, we both must take a quick bathroom break, so we stop, get off our rides, and start using the bathroom. I can't speak for my cousin, but I felt weird like something just didn't feel right. Everything seemed dead. There was no wind, no birds chirping, nothing at all. So after we relieved ourselves, we turned around and noticed a dilapidated building. Wondering why we didn't see it before, we stopped. I don't know. I really don't know how to explain the feeling I had upon looking on this thing. Regardless, we were curious, but we knew enough history of the area to not go about in an old building. So we just looked around and quickly noticed old tombstones that could easily be mistaken for big rocks as they were ancient and weathered. We had just taken a pee in an old haunted graveyard by accident. We looked at each other almost at the exact same time and said, oh crap. We quickly jumped onto the ATVs and desperately tried to start the engines, but to no avail. I turned to the key and pushed the start button and nothing, as almost if the battery was dead. My cousin's ATV was also dead. For about a minute or two, we're just trying to get our ATVs to start. And luckily, just when we thought we were screwed, at the same time our engines fired up and we proceeded to get out of there as fast as possible. I can't explain it. That sense of impending doom, like something was preying upon you, but we couldn't see or hear anything at all, was just absolutely menacing. 
When we returned to where the rest of our family was, we didn't mention it to anyone. I was happy to be with my dad and have a sense of safety. We didn't ride our ATVs for the rest of the day, and I haven't been to Pickneyville ever since. I was driving around my old friend's neighborhood, keeping an eye on the place, as it was quite the hot spot for unnatural occurrences. One such instance, when he and I were walking down his street, the sun was setting, and the evening breeze glided through the trees. All the while, a peaceful, heavy, and suffocating surrealist filled the atmosphere. Just as a shiver went up my spine, he turned to the edge of the woods and I followed suit soon after. As if on cue, a man's yell, painful and full of agony, broke the eerie serenity of the evening. Now we are both on edge and hasten our pace and walk hurriedly. His home was just ten minutes from where we were, but we knew that anything could happen between here and there if we weren't careful. About five minutes away from his house, another yell boomed from the woods. Only this time it was altered from before, becoming more and more animalistic as it dragged on. We increased our pace again, nearly running at this point. The daylight almost completely gone, and after an hour, we finally reached his front porch. That's when we heard it. Behind us we heard a screech in the woodline, an awful combination of a rooster's crow a goat's bleat, and a dog's bark. After that, whatever it was, hissed and began coming towards us at a very quick pace. The leaves in the trees rustled as it got nearer and nearer, jumping down from the branches and into the brush of the bushes and smaller foliage. We heard it land on the ground, and soon after, it came crashing towards us, stopping just before it broke out of the wood's cover. Whatever it was, began breathing heavily and pointed its bony, clawed finger out at us, curling it in a motion as if it was tempting us to come towards it. Not long after, my friend unlocked his door and swung it open, both of us stumbling inside and slamming its door shut behind us. As we did, whatever that thing was hit against it and tried to break it down, if not at the very least frighten us. It then sounded like it jumped from the porch and back into a tree, dashing back into the woods. Later that night, we heard occasional scratching and tapping noises on the windows and doors and other parts of the house, but we didn't bother to open the blinds or investigate. Thankfully, we had the pleasure of not seeing what the rest of it looked like, but we did have the misfortune of hearing its screams. That's just one of the many uncomfortable, yet equally exciting experiences we've had together. If you want to investigate the area, visit Holbrook, South Carolina. It's in Dorchester County a quaint and quiet little neighborhood. Unfortunately, most of it has been deforested for housing development, but that doesn't precisely restrain any odd things from occurring. Just be on guard and stay safe. These occurrences take place in my new home in South Carolina. For some backstory, it was the year 2006 when I moved into my current home. I used to be an avid outdoorsman, I used to, anyway. Yesterday, while out on one of my daily hikes during the evening, I found an old, rotting note. After reading this note, I highly doubt I'll be back to those woods for a long while. The note read, I was out with a few friends for a get-together for a friend of mine. He was going to leave for college in a week, so everyone wanted him to go out with a bang. We were having this get-together in some private property that one of my friends... My few friends were Brandon, Kyle, Alfred, and myself. We used this property to drive around the ATVs and dirt bikes we owned. We drank for a while quite carelessly. Eventually, one of us had the idiotic idea to ride our ATVs around to make the effects of being heavily intoxicated even more extreme. I sluggishly went along. Someone had to be able to watch and make sure nothing happened to them. But it had to be me. I had drunk the second lease to Brandon. I was basically completely sober. As we drove further, a sound that I could not describe to this day began to become more prevalent as we went further into the woods. The sound became so overpowering at one point that it covered up the loud noise of our bikes. Eventually, we were all on the ground screaming and covering our ears in pain and torment. No matter which direction we ran, even out of the woods, 
the sound would still grow louder. At this point, the sound became clear to me that it was most likely a scream. Then I saw something that I will never forget. I saw these, what I can only describe as animals. They looked like pale, light gray humanoid type creatures. They had to have stood at least four feet at the shoulder. Their heads had borne the charges of dogs, but the teeth were tiny, blood red knives. The screaming noise had ceased to stop. Then, there was one creature that stood out from the other eight. This one stood about six feet tall at the shoulder. He had a much more muscular build than the others who looked malnourished. His mouth was wide open, still bearing those sharp, long, needle-like teeth. But the biggest one, which I supposed was the leader, made a different noise. I could only describe this noise as a clicking noise. It may be necessary to mention that I have the most powerful build of all four of us. After my friend had been dragged away so inhumanly fast, I, I couldn't run that fast if my life depended on it, but at this point it did. But while my friends and I were being dragged away, I realized something. The screaming had stopped. After about two or three miles, there was a pit of bones from different animals, but the most common were human bones. The stench was so nerve-wracking that I eventually passed out. When I woke up, my friends were already dead. After seeing the bodies of my friends being eaten by the creatures, I will never be the same. The screaming stopped when the animals had something in their mouths. The screaming almost drove me insane. I resorted to feeding the creatures all my family, friends, and pets. All the people I know are gone. My family, friends, and even my pets are gone. I think the police are beginning to understand what is going on now. They have been showing up at my house more and more lately. The screaming won't stop. I have nothing to feed them except for myself. This is my suicide letter before I jump into the place where I keep the creatures away from all society. Anyone who finds this note, please drop the note now and run. I don't want anyone else to suffer my fate. Now, for whatever reason, I believe that this note is truly genuine more and more by day. A strange screaming noise has been coming closer to my home every night that I keep hearing. I, I, I don't know how much longer I'll be able to live here. Every night they just get a little bit closer and a little bit closer. With my trusty revolver at my side tonight, I will most likely not be able to sleep. The sounds that I hear at night freak me out so bad that I can't sleep and I have to somehow find some sort of prescription drug to make it work. I could hear a scratching noise at my door recently. I'm hoping that things are gonna improve before I get out of here, or hopefully at least hold off until I move. I plan to move back in with my parents in a few days time. Wish me luck because I sure as hell am gonna need it. Like I said, when I first found that note, I thought it was just some sort of short scary story, maybe something that somebody had put there to scare people. But after I'm starting to experience these things myself, this story is starting to seem a little bit more real. I wish I had more information on this story. It was a very brief encounter that has always stayed with me since I was young. It may not be the most eventful, but it creeped me out. It started when I was young, when I was about six or seven years old. My family lived in an old house with a few dogs in South Carolina. It was far from uneventful there. I heard strange noises and saw strange lights outside our house. I was convinced the place was haunted. As it turns out, I may not have been wrong. One of the weirdest things that ever happened to me happened outside of that house. I used to go outside a lot back then. I loved being outside and the feeling of being out there regardless of how warm or cold it was, was freeing to me. But I usually came back in before it got too dark out. I didn't stay out in the middle of the night, but one day, I decided to stay out just for a bit longer into the evening. It was getting around 6.30 when I finally decided to go back inside that day. But before I did, I was interrupted by something extraordinary. Above my house was this sort of hill past a road that went through a forest. Up there was a neighborhood, plenty of people living there, at least for some nowhere southern town. Up there was a strange figure. I'd say it was tall, maybe six feet tall, but it was hard to tell from where I was standing. 
and the memories had been understandably vague since I was very young. I just sat there, staggered in disbelief. A tall, pitch-black humanoid figure loomed over me just over the hill. It was blank, and just black, sort of like a shadow. It looked distorted, though, like the shadow was moving around like static TV, if that makes any sense. Me being young and confused, I was stunned. It was so bizarre. I didn't know what to do, but the door was right behind me so I could run back into my parents at any moment. I felt safe for that reason. I waved at the creatures as it stood there, and it gave me some sort of wave back for a few seconds. I was so creeped out that chills went down my spine. My heart was pounding, and goosebumps rose on my arms. It looked human and was now acting human. It started making other motions, and the thing, honestly, kind of had a mind of its own, but also was copying my every movement. I started making other motions, and the thing just copied them every time. I even walked closer and poked behind a tree and it pretended to do the same, even though there was no tree for it to hide behind. I was thoroughly amused. I realized I would probably seem like a madman making weird motions to anybody who saw me. I looked around to see if anybody was looking. When I looked back at the creature, it was no longer there. The way it just stood there at first and then copied my every motion later was so strange and downright creepy the more I think about it. It seems like it was straight out of a horror story or something. The start of some climactic series of events. But I never saw anything like it again. I'm sure there has to be some sort of plausible explanation somewhere out there. But until then, this is the only paranormal story that I have. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true scary horror stories from the South. If you enjoyed this video and the stories within it, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it and that helps me grow. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Be sure to slap that subscribe button and turn on notifications as I upload nearly every single day and you're not going to want to miss a single story. If you have a story that you would like to share that might potentially be featured in a future episode, be sure to send in your story at swampdweller.net or on reddit at r slash the dark swamp. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Thank you guys as always for supporting the swamp the way you do. I very much appreciate all of it. If you have made it to the end, be sure to let me know what story tonight was your favorite and comment the code word Red Bandit to confuse anybody who didn't make it to the end. Plus, I always love seeing the creative and funny comments you guys come up with with these code words. I'll see you all soon with another creepy video.